morning, everybody. Our Bible reading today is taken from Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Have you ever wanted to have the perfect comeback for a situation? Maybe someone asks you a bit of a curly question. Maybe someone... Um, you know, he challenges you, makes fun of you, dares you to do something foolish, and you just wish you had the perfect response. How do we respond in those situations? A few years ago, uh, Tracy's extended family, we had a, you know, all gathered together. Um, I think it was for Christmas, it might have been a birthday, I can't remember. Megan was 15 at the time, so it was about eight years ago. And Megan has a cousin, very similar age to her, who was also 15 uh, at the time. And some of us were playing a board game. Uh, Megan's cousin Emily, who's 15, I was playing and Emily was playing and some others. And Emily won the board game. Now one of the other relatives who was present at the time, not playing the game, but he was present, and he said to me in front of the whole group, he said, Hey Dave, how does it feel getting beaten by a 15-year-old girl? Well, what can you say? You know, she beat me fair and square, um, but this relative couldn't help you know, having a go at me. I'm sure it was all in fun, but... You know, I've got to be honest, the statement kind of bothered me on, in, in multiple ways. Anyway, later that day, we all went out 10-pin bowling. And as it turned out, Megan was in the same lane as this other relative. And Megan won. Megan beat him in the game. So as we walked out to the car, Megan couldn't help herself. And she said, hey, uncle, how does it feel? Beaten by a 15-year-old girl. So to me, that was, you know, the perfect response. It's fair to say that relative, maybe he didn't enjoy the moment quite as much as everyone else did, but my family and I, we have remembered that story ever since. And in the Bible reading today, Jesus always seems to have the perfect response. You might recall just before Christmas, I preached a sermon uh, based on Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. We looked at the genealogy of Jesus and also the Christmas story. And in a couple more weeks, I plan to start a series on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which includes some of the most famous sayings of Jesus. M many people uh, believe the Sermon on the Mount is one of the, if not the most, significant and influential speech ever recorded in human history. And the Sermon on the Mount is recorded in three chapters of Matthew, chapter 5, 6 and 7. So rather than just jump into the Sermon on the Mount, I thought we might as well look up, you know, read through the chapters leading up to and preceding to the Sermon on the Mount so we can find out what happened you know, before and leading up to uh, that speech. Obviously the Sermon on the Mount is significant not only for the words that were said but because of who said those things. And in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2 we saw Matthew taking great effort to explain to us how significant Jesus is. His family tree, his heritage, his birth, uh, all of these things were planned by God centuries in advance. It was not just some random event. Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus was and is the Messiah, the, the Son of God, the Chosen One, the Saviour of the world. And then two weeks ago we had Rod Draper came and preached for us and 
at my request, he looked at Matthew chapter 3 and we read about the baptism of Jesus. John the Baptist had come preaching and uh, challenging people to be baptised as a sign of their repentance, as a sign of their commitment and devotion to God. And Jesus himself came to be baptised by John. Even though John knew and pointed out that Jesus is in fact greater than John, nevertheless, Jesus was baptised by John. And Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 uh, describes how as Jesus came up out of the water after being baptised, a voice from heaven spoke saying, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. We saw even more evidence there of the significance and the importance of Jesus. And Matthew, the author, is explaining all this for a purpose. He's showing us the background. He's showing us the detail. He's explaining to us all these prophecies that are being fulfilled because he wants us to understand who Jesus is. And then today we get to chapter 4, or the start of chapter 4. We'll finish chapter 4 next week. And today we read about temptation. And we all want to know the perfect response to temptation, don't we? So the first thing we need to understand about temptation is that temptation is normal. Okay, everyone is tempted at some point in their life. I think most of us are tempted in some way or another pretty much every day of our life. And being tempted is not a sin, but it can lead us into sin. So therefore, it's, it is wise and sensible to avoid temptation if we can. How we respond to the temptation is really the important thing. Verse 1 of today's passage says that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness so we need to acknowledge sometimes god does allow us to have these testing times you might call it a a wilderness experience a a testing time a a dark night of the soul you know there's lots of phrases you might use and uh, these can be challenging times difficult times no one really puts their hand up and volunteers to go through these times but they're also great opportunities for growth james chapter 1 starting at verse 12, says that God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember when you are tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us down. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow... It gives birth to death. So temptation is normal. We can't always avoid it, but we should avoid it as much as possible. Not because of the temptation, but because of where the temptation can lead. And God will not tempt us or entice us to do anything wrong. It is the devil, Satan, who tempts us. And Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. And we can learn ourselves we can learn not only from these temptations but also from the way jesus responds to the temptation the first temptation in verse three and four is the common one physical needs jesus is hungry for food and we all get hungry at times in life don't we maybe maybe for food maybe for companionship maybe for recognition maybe we have a a longing in our heart in our life for something else and satan tries to use that longing against us Now, obviously, for Jesus to eat, that was not a sin, not at all. But for Jesus to use his powers for personal satisfaction, that would have been inappropriate. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God has has delivered his people from slavery, and then they're in the desert, and there's not enough food, and they're hungry, and so God provides food for them. Manna from heaven that literally just appears on the ground every day, and they just go out and gather it and eat it. So God provided everything they needed, even though it took a miracle every single day, God provided what they needed. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses reminds the people, God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, but rather we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And that's the verse that Jesus then quotes Now, of course, Jesus could easily have turned those stones into into bread. Jesus knew that God could perform a miracle like that simply and easily. But Satan's sneaky. He doesn't wait until you've finished a nice, 
big healthy meal and then try and tempt you with you know some stale bread or some liver or something, does he? Because that would be an easy temptation to resist. No one would be sucked into that one. Satan waits until you are yearning for something and then he offers it to us in an inappropriate way. It might seem harmless, it might seem, you know, no big deal, but when Satan offers us something, there's always a catch. There's always a sting in the tail, a line that we cross that can lead us to bigger temptations. He might tempt us to buy something that we we can't really afford. He might want us to take something that doesn't really belong to us. He might want us to use something or someone in an inappropriate way. In Genesis chapter 3, the original temptation was very similar to this one. The devil said to Adam and Eve, if you want to be like God, just eat this fruit. And they did. They ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. They sinned. And now Satan says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, just take these stones and turn them into bread. No big deal. Satisfy your hunger. No one gets hurt. Not a problem. And Jesus is the son of God. He could easily perform that miracle. No big deal. But Jesus said, no. In effect, Jesus is saying he will trust God to provide his needs. He's not going to you know, do something inappropriate to satisfy himself. The Bible tells us, and Jesus himself taught us, that God will provide all of the things that we need in life. And so Jesus is practising what he preaches and trusting God to provide. Which leads us to the second temptation. When Satan, in verse 5 to 7, Satan takes Jesus to the holy city up on the highest point of the temple and he says, if you're the son of God, then jump off. Satan even quotes the Bible. And some of the cross point people might be familiar with this, this passage from Psalm 91. Satan quotes it. He says, the scripture says, God will order his angels to protect you. They will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Satan is basically saying, all right, if you want to trust God, then prove it. How far will you trust him? And Satan is He's reminding Jesus, hey, God is going to look after you. Look, throw yourself down. God will save you. You won't get hurt. Nothing will go wrong. God will do a miracle. It'll be exciting. People will notice. It'll be, you'll be famous. You'll get attention. If you're the son of God, surely you want attention. You want everyone to notice you. Well, here's your chance. Just throw yourself down. God will do something spectacular and everyone will notice. It'll be great. Satan takes the Bible verse and tries to twist it to his own advantage. Notice Jesus doesn't dispute the truth of the scripture, but he replies that the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. God does promise to provide for us, to protect us. That doesn't mean we do foolish and dangerous things, does it? Well, I hope not anyway. Like I've said before about Peter getting out of the boat to walk on the water in the storm, he, he only do that when it is... God or Jesus who is asking you to step out of the boat. If you do that for any other person or any other reason, you are going to get wet. You're going to get hurt. So we need to be confident that it is God calling us before we do something reckless like that. So this is not a lack of faith that Jesus is demonstrating. This is a respect for God that Jesus is demonstrating. And then finally in verse 8 to 10, Satan takes Jesus to a mountain peak and he shows him all the kingdoms all the continents, all the the wonders of this world and he says I'll give all of this to you if you just kneel down and worship me now once again there's nothing intrinsically wrong with wanting or having all the kingdoms of the world I mean that would be pretty awesome wouldn't it to have someone offer that to you ultimately they belong to God anyway but, but Satan will often tempt people like this, he will say you can have it, the fame the fortune, the popularity, the power, the pleasure, whatever it is that you're hungering for, Satan says, I can give it to you. All you have to do is just worship something other than God. Change your priorities so that, so that God is, just put him on the back burner for a little while and pursue this dream, this goal, this power, this pleasure, this privilege. I can give it all to you. Just compromise your beliefs. And the Bible is clear, crystal clear, as Jesus says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. 
So Jesus is not saying, look, not interested, I don't want those kingdoms, they, don't mean, they mean nothing to me. Jesus is saying, God is more important and I will not compromise my devotion to God, not even for all the kingdoms of the world. In this case, Jesus is saying the end does not justify the means because to worship Satan would be a disaster and Jesus would not do it. Now, Satan tempts us with material things, with pleasure, with knowledge, with wealth, and they can all, on their own, they can be good things, but Satan will tempt us to misuse those things. So we will be tempted, and this is normal. We cannot always avoid temptation. Some temptations are obvious and easy to to see, but others are subtle and sneaky, and they seem harmless, but they can lead us down a path that leads to destruction. So it's wise to avoid temptation as much as possible. You know, things can seem nice but not always be as nice as they look. My favourite TV show is called Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. Um, I just, it's a very amusing show. And one episode uh, is a flashback to when Ray first meets Deborah, his wife. And Deborah says, your family seem nice. And Ray says, yeah, they seem nice. And you have to laugh because you know they're not as nice as they look. And Deborah, has, by the time she marries into the family, she's well aware you know, that things were not as nice as they seem. And temptation can seem nice, but things are not as nice as they seem. So if there are places that you go, if there are things that you watch, activities that you're involved in that invite temptation, then it's wise to avoid those things. If, they only, if we avoid those things, it help us, helps us to avoid the temptations that can come from those things. You might have heard the phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Or another phrase is, what goes into your mind comes out in your life. So if we fill our mind with tempting things and unhealthy things and ungodly things, that will affect the way we live and that is not wise. One quote I read this week said, temptation's not a sin, but playing with temptation invites sin. So point one is that temptation is normal. But point two is that we can resist temptation. Jesus was able to resist temptation because he knew his Bible and his loyalties and his priorities were firmly set and he would not compromise them. Jesus knows he's here to do God's will and he refuses to deviate from that path. Not for personal satisfaction, not for pleasure, not for knowledge or excitement or attention, not even for all the kingdoms of the world would Jesus compromise his devotion to God. There's another old saying, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, I can resist anything except temptation. And it's kind of amusing, but there's a lot of truth in that, which is why it is wise to avoid the temptation if we can. See, Jesus is not only our saviour, not only our Lord, he's also a great example for us to learn from. And Jesus resisted temptation. He used Bible quotes, which is a great reminder of how useful it is to to read our Bible, to know our our Bible, if possible even to memorise Bible verses so we can call them up when we need them. But we also find a useful clue in verse 2 when it says that Jesus fasted for 40 days. Now, in Bible times, fasting was nearly always accompanied by prayer. Now, nowadays, people, we just pray fast. In those days, they would pray and fast, which was actually a whole lot healthier um, spiritually. So Jesus was well prepared when this temptation came because he had spent time in prayer. He was uh, communicating with God, and that helped him to resist the temptations. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us, the temptations in your life and no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, God will show you a way out so that you can endure. That's a great, a great promise. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed by the temptation, but God will not allow too much. If we keep our trust in him, even just a quick prayer, Lord, help me out of this one, God will always provide a way out. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says we should run away from sin. Now, it's good to remember not only we can resist temptation, but actually we should resist temptation. 
We should avoid sin. Now, sometimes, let's be honest, people do the wrong thing because purely by accident, no, no bad intention, they just, um, ignorance or accidentally, we, we all do do the wrong thing at times, in, uh, inadvertently. But other times, people can convince themselves that it's okay to give in to temptation because, you know, no one's going to know about it and no one will get hurt and you know, it'll be fun for a little while and it's all just harmless and it won't matter. Wrong. God, God always knows. God sees. God knows what you're doing. God knows your thoughts. God knows your heart. So you can't fool God. In fact, that kind of attitude is really treating God like a fool, which never goes down well. And also, another old saying is, be sure your sins will find you out. When I was a child... My parents and I were lived in, in Papua New Guinea and at one time we went on this church camp and uh, the campsite was next door to a, a chook farm with big long rows of, of chicken coops and we were specifically told not to go over the fence into the chicken coop. Now one day an older boy than me, I'm not sure why, but he took me with him and we climbed the fence and went into the chicken coop. And we were just looking around and then all of a sudden we heard this man yelling at us, what are you doing in here? Get out! And well, I've got to be honest, we were petrified. We ran for our lives. We got out. I don't remember that boy's name. don't remember anything about him. And I never told my parents the story of that day. But years and years later, we were visiting some friends of my parents. And somehow that camp came up in conversation. And these friends knew the story of what I had done going into the chicken farm. Oops. My parents were quite surprised. Did you do that? Yes, so I did. And the other man who was telling the story, he laughed and he said, be sure your sins will find you out. And I've never forgotten that saying because it came true for me that day. Integrity is a word that we talk about, uh, something that we uh, aspire to. It can be difficult to define, but for me, <clears throat> integrity means doing the right thing even when nobody is watching might mean there's no reward for doing the right thing. might mean there's no shame or embarrassment for getting caught doing the wrong thing. But integrity is doing the right thing regardless, even when no one is watching, just because it is the right thing to do. And God will always see, and God will always know. And as Christians, we are called to be witnesses for Jesus. And let's be honest, sometimes our lives speak louder than our lips. Now, obviously, we all fail at times. All of us have failed at times. And chances are, we're all going to fail again. Let's not kid ourselves. We might try to avoid the temptations, but we can't always. And we might try to resist, but we, sometimes we don't. When that happens, it is important to also remember 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So don't beat yourself up and have an you know, eternal guilt trip. Talk to God, confess to God, make it right with God because that's what really matters. <clears throat> but if possible, we should resist temptation. Not only because it's embarrassing when people find out, but also because God tells us to. James 4, 7, humble yourselves before God Resist the devil and what happens? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we can and we should resist temptation. And one more thought. When we are tempted to, you know, maybe take the easy way out, take the, take the free option, you know, free cheese is always available. Anyone here like cheese? Not me, but some people do. Anyone want some free cheese? Yeah, well, free cheese is always available in mouse traps. So it might be funny when we're setting the trap. It's not so funny when you're the mouse. And in Satan's mind, we are the mouse. He will set a trap, set a snare, and try to entice us. Not for our benefit, absolutely not, because he wants to destroy us. So resist the devil. Avoid temptation, because the temporary happiness is not worth the long-term pain. So how do we deal with temptation? What is the perfect response to temptation? Well, 
prayer, really. Even if it was just that's a quick prayer on the spare of the moment, Lord, what do I do here? Lord, help me out. You know, God is there. God will hear. God will answer. So how do we deal with temptation? The same way Jesus did. Trust God. Keep God as your highest priority no matter what. Serve God and only God. Obviously it helps to know your Bible and it helps to pray. So let's do that right now. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you again for the wisdom in your your Bible, for the example of Jesus and how much we can learn from him. And Lord, I pray for all of us in our daily lives. Give us the wisdom to avoid temptation if possible. And when we can't avoid it, give us the strength to resist. And when we can't resist, we just want to say thank you for the promise of forgiveness. Thank you again for Jesus and all that you have done for us. Lord, we just, we're your servants, your children, and we're so grateful. And we just commit ourselves to you again today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.